Welcome to Talking Jazz, and my guest today is a saxophonist, composer, band leader, Jane Burnett, who is joining me from Canada, from her cabin, where she's been for the last year, trying to figure out where we're heading. I'm very excited to talk to her. I've known her for several years now. She came to us, to Bloomington. We did some things together, and it's been just a real treat to get to know her and, and listen to the music. One thing that we have in common is leading all female groups and we'll go through that venture first before we head back in history and, and catch up on, on some of the earlier things. Jane has been leading a group called Makeke. The group is composed of a group of Cuban female musicians. So first, welcome Jane. Thank you, Monica. It's great to be on your show. Congratulations. I, over many, many years, I found myself pretty much always the only woman instrumentalist on a bandstand or sitting in. It really hit home. Larry and I started a program called Spirit of Music. We saw that through our travels in Cuba, there was 25 music conservatories and really very good music conservatories where they highly train their musicians. So we were, we were taking instruments and technicians down and doing a little bit of teaching of jazz in the in the school because it's not really part of their curriculum at all. And for many years was actually prohibited. There was so many women in the programs. If I went out at night, I would often see their boyfriends playing with me on the bandstand. The rest of the girls just sitting on the sidelines watching their boyfriends play. It drove me crazy. I'd, you know, see one, somebody who I knew, you know, played the trombone. I say, where's your trombone? You know, I was at home. I said, what's it doing at home? And they were like, no, 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 my boyfriend's playing. And I was like, that's ridiculous. I knew about Yussi Garcia because Yussi was out their playing. She was, you know, a student of the conservatories. So she studied in the, you know, very intensively. And I also knew about Yusa, who's already doing a tiny bit of touring. Those were kind of the key figures. The person that really helped me get the ball going was Daini Arosena. I had been in Cuba. I'd taken a radio station. Larry and I had taken the donors down to the, as a gift from the station for their donation. We took them to Cuba for a week and took them around to all, you know, musical activities and put on some musical activities. It was about, you know, 20, 30 people. I organized a jam session in one of the hotel cigar bar actually that was a rough place to do a jam session because everybody's puffing away on their cigars i organized a jam session there and i met Diney because it was jazz festival time in cuba and i met her and she was a very small woman pretty young at the time i think she was like 17 or 18 i heard her sing and i said hey come to the jam session you really sound great so she came her voice was way beyond her age you know if you closed your eyes it was like hearing a real old soul singing. She was singing some of the, the Yoruban material and she really loved jazz. Nina Simone sort of being her favorite. In a couple of months, I had been involved in doing these benefits in Toronto for women's shelters, which was called Sistering. Usually there was, you know, a few women from different ethnic groups and I would put together a band to back these particular women, if they're from, you know, Mali or Iran. We never had a Spanish speaking singer and we never had anybody from another country. They're all new refugees or immigrants to Toronto. I met this singer. She's really, really good. She's totally unknown. She's very young. Could I bring her? Because there's a huge Spanish speaking community in Toronto. I bent their arm and I got them to do it. And she came and she brought the house down. Everyone just does like two, three pieces. She was unbelievable. To me, this was like a real star quality and the voice to, to really do something special. So I sat down with her and I said, hey, I'm thinking of just doing this project. So, you know, it's going to be a one-off. What about if I came down to Cuba with Larry and we rehearsed some music and well, I'm going to write some stuff and we went into studio and record it. That's how it started. And so... We put the band together, six piece band. We recorded this record. Well, the first thing was the studio, the rehearsal place. Daimi said, my father runs a place called the Las Vegas, which was like kind of an underground place for it's like drag queens. And that's sort of a no-no in Cuba, right? It's prohibited, but it's not prohibited. They sort of, you know, they turn the blind eye if they just keep quiet. So anyway, he was running this place. So we started rehearsals there and they were disastrous. The place was in a basement club. You know, we got in there, there was no electricity, electricity went off. So we were sitting in the dark. So, you know, you've got electric piano. So 
can't play anything electric bass, can't play anything. And we're just all sitting there in the dark. And we had these dreadful rehearsals for the first few days. And then we had booked the studio. So we got into the studio, which basically we were spending rehearsal time in the studio and everything started to go. The piano broke. The group was really very young. Everyone was at, you know, totally different levels, inexperienced couple of people that were experienced. It was tough. We had to leave that studio. We went to another studio. I think we ended up going to three studios. We recorded, I mean, the, the bass player, Celia, she was a classical bassoonist, but she really wanted to be in the band. Borrowed a bass from somebody, gave herself a couple of weeks to figure out how to play it. I didn't know it, lo and behold, but that the bass that she was playing on was broken. So when I came back to Toronto with the tapes, because I was dealing with so many other things, right? Larry too. One of the engineers in Toronto was like, what's wrong with the bass? It sounds so bad. And I was like, yeah, the bass sounds awful. I only found out after the record came out that it was a broken bass. That she was playing so that cost like tons of money so anyway we made this record and i just felt like hey this is a dog's breakfast larry kept saying no there's something here there's something very special well, let's just keep you know tweaking it and we'll work on the sound lo and behold the record got a juno that year so i put it in we always put our records in for the juno is like the canadian grammys we put it in the j contemporary jazz and it won so that was 2015 at one. This first one is called Tormenta. It's uh, Jane Bennett and Makeke was released on Just In Time Records in 2014. And we got to know the personnel here with the AC Garcia on the drums, Amy on vocals on percussion and Yusa on the guitar, Danae Olano on the piano, Magdali Savigny on the congas, and Celia Jimenez on the bass. So here we yeah. go, Tomita. <laughs>
That was Tormenta by my guest today, Jane Burnett, with her group Makeke, a group of wonderful young Cuban women musicians. So a very special combination. We just heard the story of putting this together. And you mentioned that you've been going there for a long time and obviously doing yeah. all kinds of things and, and supporting. The title came up because of the musical heroes and the music that motivated me to want to play jazz. There was the musicians like Ross on Roland Kirk, who I so fortunately got a chance to hear in Toronto at the time when I was like in my late teens, there was a club called the Colonial, which had jazz five nights a week. And they had a Saturday matinee, you know, a few times went in with my brother and my dad. Sometimes the whole family would go. If it was something that was like, for example, the whole family would go hear Mose Allison for a Saturday matinee, or we'd go hear Horace Silver, Mingus. We actually, the whole family went to hear Charles Mingus. And that was incredible because he was such a gentleman. You know, you hear all these stories about him just being a really fiery, temperamental, unbalanced person. But that boy, we, we lucked out because he was such a gentleman. You know, music like Mingus's music, Ross on Roland Kirk. Stanley Cowell had been one of my hero piano players because of one of the recordings that Larry and I dated to was the Glass Bead Games with Clifford Jordan and Stanley Cowell, many others on it. But I mean, I was a huge Clifford Jordan fan and Stanley Cowell. So that music, like that Glass Bead Games was a fantastic record. So I, we did, you know, take a couple of pieces of Stanley's that were written and the late great Stanley Cowell, who unfortunately passed away just a few months ago. He was, you know, the founder of Strati East Records, which we put out along with Charles Tolliver, exceptional recordings. So this record with the inclusion of Dean Bowman, a singer who's now based, I think he's in Serbia. A funny story with Dean, he had been working at an agency, booking us a little bit. And I wasn't getting much work, but he was outside of Mount Vernon, I guess it was, New York. He was booking us a little bit. And then offhand, he told me that he sang. He said, yeah, I'm in a group called the Screaming Headless Torsos. Uh, David Fuzinski and some pretty heavy hitting jazz. Dean was in it and, he, and, and I said, hey, I really want to hear you sing. He sent me the record and I called him back and the record was great. And he sounded so wonderful. I said, I called Dean back and I said, you know what? You're fired as an agent because you, you haven't done anything for us, but I want to put you on the next record. He ended up being on Rhythmo and Soul, and then we put him on Spirituals and Dedications as he was basically brought up as a church singer. It was something that was very different from the other Cuban work that we, we had previously just done. I think it was also booked around a concert at the Glenn Gould Theater in Toronto. We not only did a show at that theater, but then we recorded the next couple days in the theater with Stanley Kierno. Dean Bowman, Larry on trumpet, myself and Mark McLean on drums. There we got the personnel. So let's have a listen. Let's transport ourselves back there and witness. So this is La Ferrari and this is from the album Spirituals and Dedications. Ross on Roland Kirk piece. I always loved this piece. I said Dewey, Dewey Redman, of Dewey course. Redman that, and, there, yeah. and those are two of my musical heroes, you know, Stanley Cowell and Dewey Redman. Mm -hmm. So any opportunity to play with Dewey, be standing beside him on a bandstand was awesome. That mentorship is, is priceless. Let's have a listen. Here it is. <laughs> Love for Bright, 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 Bright moments. Bright moments. Bright moments. Bright moments. Bright moments like making love in a leaky waterbed in the Holiday Inn. Bye. 
to make this record, which was with this group, uh, Changui de Guantanamo, that's who we collaborated with. Like when we do our projects, the ingredients or the people on the record, we really end up spending some time and rehearsing mm -hmm. and working on the stuff. And it usually means going to a location and just absorbing the whole thing. So that's what we did. We just hung out in Guantanamo. We made this great record and yeah, Dewey, I mean, wanted to go to Guantanamo, wanted to go to Cuba. He'd never been, it didn't work out that he could go. So we ended up putting his solos on the Radio Guantanamo record in Toronto. Pick party, let's have a farm party. Jangui. Jangui. Para Alfredo, this is from the Radio Guantanamo Project volume one release 2005 so the reason monica fell volume one is because we got arrested prior to that we were playing with the changui musicians in a little place called cafe de paris in sort of the central square and there had been you know guantanamo i forget about this stuff you know when i start to talk about it i went oh, oh my god yeah that's got to go in the book we were sitting in with changui group in this little cafe and we were really creating a scene because there's no tourists at this point when we did this record there's no tourists that go to Guantanamo because of the the U.S. naval base being there we were highly suspect as being doing something else they came in even though we were playing our instruments with the Changui guys and told us we couldn't play we were going what like where in the world like what do you, what do you mean we can't play with them you can't play with them. I found out much later that I apparently should have had a visa to be playing. I should have had a visa. I didn't, I didn't find that out till years later. And I just thought it was ridiculous. So they took us outside and they put us in a police car and off we went to the police station because we were suspect. Ridiculous thing was we had this young guy who was basically a street guy who was sort of being a bit of a handler and finding stuff out for us. And we were buying him Cokes and beer and stuff like giving him some money to, to do little things. Before we went off to the police station, because I felt like we we're going to be here for a while, I had some money to somebody and said, can you go get us like five beers? He went and bought us five beers and I took the beers into the police station and we're sitting in the police station and we, each one of us, there was three of us. So we, we had a photographer with us and that probably was kind of suspect that we had a photographer also. And they interrogated us. And meanwhile, we were drinking the beer and they didn't care about us drinking the beer in the police station. That was fine. It was crazy, you know, the, the TV set was on and there was had been a performance with me playing with Chucho. They do these reruns in Cuba where they keep showing the same thing over and over again, like a theater show or something, because there's this short of stuff. I had seen this a few times, Chucho and I playing, and I'm sitting there and they just think that I'm, you know, an agent of some sort. I said to Larry, this is like one of those Woody Allen moments because the TV sets on. Don't you just wish that we would come up that stuff they keep showing on television? Thing of me playing with Choo Choo and it came on. It was unbelievable. They weren't dressed as cops. They were dressed as like plainclothesmen. The guy said to me, that's not you. And I said, that's me. That's not you. No, it's not. It's not you. I said, that is me. I didn't look like me because I didn't have makeup on and all dressed up in a gown. But anyhow, so that was our first altercation. I guess we came back to Canada and then we planned for the recording and we did this recording in a little amphitheater where the Changui guys sometimes play. We had some security outside the theater so that nobody could get in. We had been recording for two days in the heat. It was real hot. It was the end of this recording day and we were going to do another one, I think the following day. And all of a sudden, our engineer, I'm in the middle of a solo, he takes the mic off and he starts collecting cords, wrapping the cords up, like right in the middle of the take. I'm going like, what's happening? What's happening? He said, I'm out of here. Immigration is here. And he had rented Casa Particular, which is like a B and B. He split. He didn't even go back to the B and B to get his things. He split with all his recording equipment. We basically hightailed it out of there. And that was the end of the recording. So there was going to be a volume two and we, ne we never did it. Well, that makes it extra exciting. All right, let's hear that. Yeah. <laughs> Alfredo from this Radio Guantanamo Project, Project Volume 1 to be continued sometime <laughs> Never. in the future. <laughs> Never. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. We'll see. Enjoy.
That was Jungri Para Alfredo from the Radio Guantanamo Project Volume 1 and we just heard the crazy story behind it mm -hmm. and I absolutely think you have to write this book with all your yeah. stories. So of course you had this group, the Spirits of Havana. That's when I got to know you. You brought them to Blooming. That was one of our first U.S. gigs. I appreciated you reaching out to us because I think you called me about doing it. It's an amazing, amazing project and, and I remember that night here in Blooming at the Waldron and in that documentary you were showing how you and Larry went down there and you fell in uh -huh. love and you learned the music started collaborating yeah give us just a quick synopsis yeah. well this group started just because of our travels the two key people that we met in 1982 were Guillermo Barreto who was one of the great jazz drummers and teachers he had played with many famous groups called you know Los Amigos with Frank Emilio and Cachao Lopez. And he was played in the style of like Joe Jones. He was a real jazzer. Even though he was a teacher of Cuban percussion at the conservatories and an adjudicator, he loved jazz. Before the revolution, you know, when the jazz clubs and the Americans were coming back and forth to Cuba for the weekends, basically, going for Friday, Saturday night, going home, he was often the drummer of choice. He was he played with Nat King Cole and Sarah Vaughn, and he broke a lot of racial barriers because they were pushing white drummers. For example, Nat King Cole wouldn't play with anybody else except Gia. Guillermo. He was a very important figure. And his wife, Mercedes Valdez, was one of the great interpreters of the Yoruban you know, music. She was a practitioner herself, the faith, Santeria, but she was also a popular singer too. And she had gone to the Apollo Theater, been part of a troupe of dance and musical group that went to the Apollo Theater representing uh, Cuba. So she straddled two worlds with her music. And she was really, you know, she was really up there. She stayed and Celia Cruz left. So it, they were kind of friends at one point. Larry and I had heard about them and we decided to meet them. 20 years older than both of us, but we hit it off with them. We continued to, you know, hang out at their place and go hear Mercedes perform for some ceremonies. Then the idea fell. Larry and I had gone. It was the last year that Arturo Sandoval was artistic director of the Havana Jazz Festival. So this was 1990. I went with Don Pullen to perform with Bobby Carcasses and his band, a special guest. And that was our first taste of collaborating with Cuban musicians. And I was hanging out with Mercedes and Guillermo and learning more about the music and more, more about the folkloric music and all styles of Cuban music, really. The idea then started to hit. What about collaborating? What about doing something with Cuban music? Nobody else at that time seemed to be doing anything. And we had this opportunity being Canadians, which was how we ended up going to Cuba because of a very cheap trip that was advertised in the paper, like 300 and something dollars. One week in Cuba, three meals a day, airline and hotel. What the hell? Let's see what happens. We went and we had no idea you know, what a musical place it was. It was just music everywhere and different styles of music. And then you'd go to different provinces and it was totally different sounds. It was musical adventure. We started to talk to Mercedes and Guillermo about planning something. And Mercedes had just started working with a folkloric group named Yoruba and Dabo, have become quite famous over the years. At that point, they were just dock workers. They couldn't go into the studios. They weren't allowed in the studios because you have an identification card. And if you're a musician, or a technician at the studio, it'll say on your card. But these guys, dock workers, they weren't allowed in. So Mercedes and Guillermo worked very hard to get them into the studio and worked very hard to get us into the studio because we were foreigners and we weren't allowed to go into the studio. You have to remember everything's state run and prohibited. The answer to everything is no. We ended up making this amazing record with three incredible piano players, Hilario Duran, Gonzalo Rubalcaba, and Frank Emilio, Yoruba and Dabo, Mercedes, and Guillermo. That record came out, recorded it 91. But we talked about it for two, three years. And it took us two, three years to cut through that red tape. That record got a Juno, which was really, really exciting for us. The following year, we brought everybody to Toronto, part of first WOMAD that was opening up in Toronto, down by our harbor front. But well, we're going to listen to a tune called The River, which is from the Ritmo and Soul release, 2000 release and features your husband, yourself, and 
Hilario Duran and Roberto Ochi Pinti, Quinto, and Dean Bowman, our famous Bowman. vocalist, is back. Yeah. Here we go. Enjoy. <laughs>
That was The River by Jane Bonnet and the Spirits of Havana from her Rhythm and Soul 2000 release. And we just heard amazing stories, what you were able to do with that collaborative spirit. You know, it takes special people to be able to reach out and say, let's, let's do this and let's work on two years getting visas and permissions and go in jail and who cares? We just want to do these collaborations. You know, early on, we heard the story of Markeke and, and what you've been doing for the these young musicians. So what's the update? Are they building their careers? Are they moving <laughs> out there? Are you playing Since instead COVID. of the boyfriends? <laughs> we really miss each other. It's funny, I don't miss the performing, but I miss rehearsing and the collaborating. I have to admit, that's my favorite part about working on recordings, the workshopping and the sessioning. I love the process. I love writing a tune and bringing the tune in. And I know you, because I've worked with you on this and I know you're you're the same way getting the input from people like hey okay this is what this is what I'm intended does anybody else have any ideas here that we can maybe bring into the mix and I just, I just love that so much when this group came about I didn't realize it would at the same time give me sort of a boost in a different way like the new energy you know like a new fresh energy as an artist like I mean done a lot of recordings and you plateau it's so often that you know you get to a certain thing and then boom everything kind of slumps down and it's hard to know what to do next and sometimes get motivated and you're always trying to do better than your what you just that lasted. So there's an inner competitiveness that that happens. This group has helped me sort of often sort of get over those things because we don't work in isolation. When the girls come up, we have to because we're waiting for the visas. Mm -hmm. There's no embassy in the in the Cuba. We have to wait in Toronto. First, the petition has to be cleared approved then the visa appointments have to be set up and then when the visa appointment if they have their visa appointment then you have to wait for the approval of the visa so all these things there's a time frame and in that time frame we have to stick together and everyone has to live in our house it's a difficult thing because as a you know a privacy our, our privacy goes but at the same time you can't have one thing without the other that's the way it's worked we'll give it one more shot and see how we do for the next record and touring la linea it's the same person personnel as we had earlier we heard about the juno award and the grammy on from on firm ground jane Bennett and makeke enjoy <laughs> Thank you. 
album On Firm Ground by Jen Binet with her group Makeke, a 2019 release. Very, very recent. So we got one last one to go and I couldn't resist putting on the one duet that we got to record. In 2014, I had a similar idea and great minds think alike. I mean, we've not talked about this. So you were putting together Makeke and I was saying we need more advocacy for those women in jazz and showcase them and I actually called you and said would you do that with me <laughs> the time was ripe and we saw the effects pretty soon after you know with the me too movement with all mm -hmm. the collectives forming it was something in the air saying it's it's about time let's let's do this let's showcase mm -hmm. them. let's get an equal space at the table so the group i put together i called it the whole world in her hands at the time which was way too long so we shortened it to she rose eventually everybody brought in music i just you know and, and i so appreciated everybody coming together because i pretty much called them out of the blue and they trusted me and you brought in the song for argentina this was at the very end of the recording session pretty much everybody was like i'm done it's late night and we just said okay we can't can't get people together anymore. You know, the bass player left, Lenny is sick. Let's just play this as a duet together. And I thought it came out great. So give us just a little backdrop of Song for Argentina. You you wrote it. I've always liked, when I used to play piano, more seriously than I do like now just to sit down and compose, I always really loved the music that had that Latin tinge, you know, that tango, habanero. I guess Debussy and Ravel and some of the other modern composers where they really, it's very evocative. I, I like the way to, you put it. It's one of those romantic type melodies with the lilt behind it. It is a little sad sounding, moving over the dance floor in the evocative fashion. That'll be our grand finale. And I so appreciate you hanging out with me and, and tuning in from the cabin. Same here. Board so to say. And well, it's been a real treat having you, Jane. Good luck to all of us. We'll be back on the road. Keep me posted with all you're doing. Send me some shots of your son climbing up the wall and stuff. Here's Song for Argentina from the 2016 Wailing City released The Whole World in Her Hands featuring my guest Jane Burnett on the soprano sax and myself on the piano. Enjoy! <laughs>
Listening to Talking Jazz today, my guest was saxophonist, composer, band leader, Jane Bennett. Tune in for Talking Jazz every Thursday at 11 a.m. and every Monday at 7 p.m. right here on WETF 105.7 FM in South Bend, Indiana, or online at WETFTheJazzStation.org. Also find videos of previous shows on YouTube on the Monica Hersick channel. That's M-O-N-I-K-A-H-E-R-Z-I-G. Subscribe to get the newest updates. Thank you for listening.